Hi, in this video we're looking at bond polarity, which really comes into play when we talk about covalent bonds. So don't forget, we've got three types of bonds. We have ionic, we have covalent, and we have metallic. If we're talking about that middle category there with uh, covalent bonds, those are only nonmetal atoms. Sometimes if an atom's electronegativity differs enough from the other atom's electronegativity, the shared electrons spend more time around one atom as opposed to the other. And what ends up happening is a, a little bit of a charge builds up and that results in this little tiny magnetic pull. And that's what a polar bond would be. Um, so let's dive in to just looking at an example. Uh, if I've got a kind of scale of electronegativity here from zero to four, and let's say I look at carbon. Carbon has its electronegativity value at 2.55. Now what that means is Carbon kind of wants electrons. I mean, it more wants electrons than it doesn't want electrons. Um, really kind of indifferent would be right there at two. Uh, and really not wanting electrons would be closer to zero. Carbon's at that 2.55 point, which means it could use electrons. Now, let's say I had a bond between carbon and phosphorus. Phosphorus has a somewhat similar electronegativity, 2.19. The difference in these, if I just subtract away the difference, or subtract away to find the difference, uh, would be 0.36. Now that's a pretty small difference between the amount that these two different types of elements want electrons. And I'll tell you, when the difference is this small, we call this type of bond a nonpolar covalent bond. Nonpolar covalent means that the nonmetals involved in this bond have similar electronegativity values, and when that takes place, they tend to share electrons evenly. Now, I know that this is gonna be a nonpolar covalent bond because the electronegativity difference, or this delta En, by the way, delta here just means change in, or the difference in. Um, the delta En is between zero and 0.4. When the electronegativity difference between the two elements in a, in a covalent bond is so small, we call it a nonpolar covalent bond, and here's why. Let's go back to P and C. If this is uh, the bond between phosphorus and carbon, and I think of this almost like it's a tug of war, phosphorus and carbon are essentially evenly matched when it comes to pulling on the shared electrons between these two elements. And that means that they're going to spend, these two, these two electrons here are going to spend about equal time between phosphorus and carbon. And so there isn't going to be a buildup of charge on one side of the bond or the other. Now, let's say I have a different example on this same scale where there is a big enough difference uh, between electronegativity values to cause these electrons to spend more time around one side of the bond as opposed to the other. Let's take hydrogen as one example. Hydrogen has uh, 2.20 as its electronegativity value. And let's say that it's in a bond with chlorine. Now chlorine is in group 17. It's got seven valence electrons. It's one of the smaller halogens. It really wants uh, valence electrons. That 3.16 uh, electronegativity value tells it all. It, it pretty much wants one more electron and hydrogen has got one. So in this scenario here, the difference in electronegativity is 0.96. Uh, now that's a little bigger, that falls out of that zero to 0 to 0.4 range. And so this difference would be classified as a polar covalent bond. Now here's what's going on in polar covalent bonds. Shared electrons between two atoms spend more time around the more electronegative uh, nonmetal, that is the side that has the higher electronegativity value, because that element really, really wants to have electrons compared to the other element. They both want electrons for sure, that's why they're forming a covalent bond, but one wants them a little bit more than the other. And when that happens, those electrons will form two poles on either side of the bond. The side that has the electrons spending more time around it is gonna build up this partially negative charge, because electrons are negative, and the side that doesn't see those shared electrons as often forms a partial positive charge. Now, this happens when the electronegativity difference between the two atoms is between 0.41 and about 1.7. Now, it's kind of hard to come up with a cutoff for the upper side of the polar covalent range. 
If you check with a different chemistry teacher, they may tell you 1.6, or I've even seen 1.4, which is pretty low. Essentially, if you've got a big enough electronegativity difference and the bond is between two nonmetals, that means definitely you're going to have a polar covalent bond. Now let's see what happens with H and Cl here. H is pulling on shared electrons. Chlorine just happens to be pulling with more force on those shared electrons. So these electrons stuck between here, they spend not equal amounts of time between H and Cl. They spend a little bit more time around chlorine. And so that means unequal sharing of those electrons. Because these red electrons here are negative, that means that chlorine is going to be the side that develops a partial negative charge. Now that symbol there is weird looking. <laughs> that is a lowercase delta. A lowercase delta means, in this context, partial. So we wouldn't put just a minus sign on that side. That would imply a full negative charge. We put this delta, lowercase delta symbol to imply that it's just a partial negative charge. Now, if this side is partially negative, that must mean that the other side is partially positive, and that's true too. So what you can kind of see here is a little bit of a magnet thing going on. The hydrogen's a little bit positive, the chlorine's a little bit negative, and so these things are, are fairly good at kind of snapping together uh, positive and negative sides lining up. So that's a polar covalent bond. Now what happens if my electronegativity difference is so big that it goes beyond that 1.7 limit? Well, let's look at an example where that might happen. Let's say I have lithium, and lithium has that one valence electron. It actually would rather get rid of that one valence electron. With an electronegativity value of 0.98, that's confirmed. Lithium does not want electrons. Let's say it formed a bond with oxygen, though. Oxygen really wants electrons. It's got two valence electrons that it needs to get, six that it possesses to begin with, and it wants two more to get up to eight. And its electronegativity value of 3.44 confirms that too. So if I form a bond between these two, the electronegativity difference is enormous. It's 2.46, that is huge. On this scale of only from zero to four, it's more than half the scale difference. Uh, when this happens, this is actually an ionic bond. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice that lithium is actually a metal. So, of course, it wouldn't be forming a covalent bond. So it's not going to be nonpolar or polar. It's going to be ionic. Uh, and what happens here is that lithium is no match for oxygen's pull. Uh, and so lithium is saying, hey, here's this valence electron. And so that's what ends up happening with lithium and oxygen. We don't see any sharing of electrons at all. We see a complete electron transfer. So we've kind of slipped away from the covalent bond realm completely. We're now into the ionic bond area. So electronegativity values can certainly help us figure out if a, if a covalent bond is nonpolar or polar. 0 to 0 0.4 would be a nonpolar covalent bond. 0.41 to 1.7 would be a polar covalent bond. But beyond that, we actually slip into the ionic bond territory. Thank you.